The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Gospel of our Lord. Stand up on your own two feet and plead your case. Now, I'm not going to ask how many have ever been to court before. I don't want that kind of embarrassment, of course. Well, now I'm starting to think about it a little bit. Maybe I do. But no, don't, don't answer. Um, if you've ever been on trial, not just sitting in on somebody else's case, but if you've ever been on trial, you know the feelings that are going on inside. You feel queasy, you feel nervous, you feel like your knees are knocking, your voice is shaking, probably. I mean, I would. It would be horrible to be in that situation. I don't want to ever be in that situation. But imagine if the judge were not some local magistrate from, out, from Rowan County, but imagine if the judge was God and he said, plead your case. I find you guilty, but I'll give you a chance to plead your case. Are you even going to open your mouth? I mean, really, are you going to try to plead your case when God says you're guilty? I have found you guilty, but just for the sake of argument, try to reason your way out of this one. This is what he's saying through the prophet Micah. In fact, he gets to the point where he says these two words, I've heard these two words before, growing up, so have you. And if you're like me as a parent, you may have said these words to your children, which gives you a pretty clear idea of how God, speaking through Micah, thinks of the people. Are you ready for the two words? Steal yourself. Get ready, because I'm going to really give them to you. Answer me. I heard that from my dad so much growing up. You know why? Because I'd stand there like a doofus looking at him. He'd tell me I needed to do something or he'd ask me why I hadn't done something or he asked me why I acted out or did something wrong and that, that was me. And you know, a dad can only take that for so long and they finally say, answer me. That's what God is saying but not just to the people that Micah is prophesying to. God's saying it to you and to me. Now, every Sunday, we do a very serious thing at the beginning of the worship service. And I don't mean the prelude, and I don't mean announcements. I mean confession. Confession. That's the time when God is saying to you, answer me. During confession, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but when I stand there and I'm about to pray, merciful God, and you all join with me in the prayer of confession, I don't just jump right into it, do I? Thank you. I, I always give you a moment or two to do something, to answer God. God has found you guilty of any number of things. Now, maybe you've lied during the week. Maybe you've cheated somebody. Maybe you've taken the Lord's name in vain. Maybe you didn't honor the Sabbath or the Lord's Day in the past Sunday 
Or maybe some other Sunday, and then all of a sudden your conscience brings it up to you. Maybe you went through a spell in your life for years and years where you didn't honor the Sabbath. And now it's beginning to weigh on your conscience. God's way of saying, answer me. Maybe you have coveted that 85-inch flat-screen 4K TV that your neighbors got because the Super Bowl's on this afternoon, and you'd really like to watch it on that. Well, that's a sin. I don't mean it's a sin to watch the Super Bowl. I'd like to be able to say that it's a sin, but it's a sin to covet your neighbor's TV or your neighbor's anything. Maybe you got an eye load of your neighbor's husband and you thought, hmm, that'd be kind of nice, wouldn't it? That's wrong. That's coveting. And just for, you know, shaking it all out evenly, maybe you guys got an eye load of the neighbor's wife and you thought, well, I wonder what that would be like. That's wrong. That's a sin. God accuses you of that, and he says, answer me. Or maybe uh, you thought, you know, we'd just be a lot better off in this world if that lady would just shut up and die. I tried not to look at any ladies present this morning when I said that. I I was actually, for those of you who are uh, Trump aficionados, I was talking about the Speaker of the House. So let me, again, just for fair shakes, let me say it the other way. Maybe some of you are out there thinking, you know, our country would be a lot better off if the president would just up and die. It's wrong. Either one of those is wrong, horribly wrong. Because thinking that is the same as doing it, Jesus says. Thinking somebody ought to be dead is the same thing as killing them. Or maybe you've thought, well, you know what? I think that that lady just must be a drunkard. I've seen all kinds of uh, memes across social media in the past few weeks saying so. That's wrong. That's bearing false witness against somebody else. It's a sin to do such a thing. Now, you didn't know you did so much sinning, did you? Because you're all guilty of at least half the things I just talked about whether you've recognized it in yourself or not. So next Sunday when we have confession and absolution, and I pause for a moment there before the prayer of confession, try to squeeze all that in, would you, and answer God. You can't do it, can you? You can't squeeze all your sins in. I could give you all afternoon, and you'd still be thinking up one more sin that you've committed. So how are you going to possibly answer God? You cannot. You cannot answer the charges. God is the one, God declares through Micah, who brought his people up out of Egypt, out of the land of bondage, out of the land of slavery. God is still the God who's doing this today. Why is this interjected at this point? Answer me. I'm the God who's done this, why does he bring it up then? You'd think maybe later on, or maybe he would have entered, maybe he could have led with that, you know? Gotten our attention right up front, as though he didn't get our attention. Because that's the answer. He says, answer me, and he gives you the answer right away. It's kind of like me teaching Sunday school, Kathy. It's kind of like the way I teach Sunday school, where I give you the answer, and then I ask you the question. See if you're paying attention. You know, the rest of you, the vast majority of you who don't come to Sunday school, you ought to think about it. You know, give Kathy and Joe and Eddie and Betty and them, uh, you know, spell them a little bit. Come to Sunday school and watch how I do that. I'll give you all the answers first. You just got to pay attention. Then when I ask the questions, you're ready. Answer me. See, I could do it that way. Next Sunday, that's what I'm going to do during Sunday school. I'm going to ask a question. And when everybody sits there silently, I'm going to go, answer me like God does through Micah. He gives the answer right after the question. I brought you out of slavery. Your slavery to sin and Egypt, I've delivered you from that. You don't deliver you from that. 
all those sins you committed and we're just talking about the Ten Commandments and you've broken at least half of them by a really quick recollection over the course of the week, I have delivered you. So when the psalmist asked the question, who may dwell in your tabernacle? Whew. Have you ever thought, I mean, speaking of coveting, have you ever driven by a house and go, ooh, I think I'd like to live there? You ever done that? I'll raise my hand. I've done it. You show me a nice rundown craftsman house, I want to live there because I like the style and I like to fix them up. Now, that's a different way of thinking about coveting, wanting an old rundown house, but, you know, that's who I am. But what about God's house? If you ever wanted to live in God's house, that's all David ever wanted to do. Think about the 23rd Psalm. That's how David closes it out. He just wants to live in the house of the Lord forever. Now you talk about coveting. You talk about wanting something real badly. I don't want to just live there for a few years. Susan and I had this really nice house in Graham that we fixed up. It was an old craftsman house. And after living there for about three years, Susan went, you know, that's enough. I'm satisfied. Because I'd gotten another call and we were going to have to move away. And she just decided this was good enough. I, I wanted to live in a house like this and I've lived in a house like this and now we can go live in a house like that. She was satisfied. But what about forever? What about wanting to live someplace? I mean, forever's a long time. In fact, forever doesn't consider time at all. It's not many lifetimes. It's not many thousands of years. It's for ev -er. Or as we do in our doxologies, we add an extra ever just to push the point a little bit. If you ever wanted to live in somebody's house that long? Well, the psalmist wants to live in God's house that long, but how can you do it? How can you live there? How can you live with God in his house forever and ever? The psalmist gives the answer. You gotta have a blameless life. Well, you just admitted you're sinners. Either that or I accused you of it, but either way, it's true. You're sinners. You're not leading a blameless life. So how are you going to live in the Lord's house forever? How are you going to live with God forever if you don't have a blameless life? It says that you have to do what is right. You have to speak the truth. We all lie. Every single one of us. It's born and bred into us. Oh, you know, we do it sometimes just to, just to help the other person's possible hurt feelings. So we tell a little, what color lie is it? You know, we lie. And we're good at it. We have to have a blameless life. We have to do what's right. We have to speak the truth from our heart. And there can't be any guile upon our tongue. And we do no evil to our friends. We don't heap contempt up upon our neighbors. Ouch. Why is that dude never going to bring that trash can in? You'd think he could cut his yard at least once in a summer. This is the one I'm famous for. Well, at least he cut his grass, but he didn't have to spray it all over the street for us to walk through. I'll tell you, if you need some examples of how to heap contempt on your neighbor, just speak to your pastor. I got all <laughs> kinds of ideas. I can't live in God's holy house forever because I heap contempt upon my neighbor. Guile is sometimes, sometimes often upon my tongue. I don't always do what's right. I don't always tell the truth from my heart, and I sure haven't led a blameless life. You're thinking right now, the pastor's in trouble. And I'm thinking, so are you. But there's an answer, and God provided it through the prophet Micah. I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of slavery. We live in a different kind of house of slavery these days. We live in those uh, crude, beyond modest accommodations that sin has rendered for us. We live in that house of bondage. We confess it every Sunday morning. 
We are in bondage, in slavery to sin, and we cannot free ourselves. We're liars, we're cheats, we talk contemptibly about other people, we don't do what's right, we're not blameless, we're sinners. We confess it every week that we're in bondage. We can't change it. Priscilla has tried to change Don. She can't do it. I'm just trying to make sure he's still with us. We can't change each other. We can't change ourselves. We can't deliver ourselves. We can't redeem ourselves. We can't satisfy God by doing good stuff. It doesn't satisfy him. It's what he expects. It doesn't satisfy him. It doesn't appease him. It's what's expected of us anyway. It would be like me... uh, coming home from, from work and uh, cutting the grass and coming inside and saying, hey, honey, did you notice I cut the grass? See, see what a good job I did cutting the grass, honey? Look at, look, hey, come, 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 look at the grass. I, and I, I trimmed it too. And, 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 I, and I blew the grass out of the street and this time I didn't even blow it down the sewer. I collected it all up and put it in a bag. Look at me, honey. Didn't I do good? Who'd want to live with that? But that's the way we act. That's the way we act. We can't appease God. We can't please him, satisfy him for our lack of grass cutting, for our sinning, by then doing what's expected of us because it's simply expected of us. Hmm? He's the only one that can satisfy the situation. God's the only one who can fix it, and God's the only one that can satisfy God. You and I can't do it. The collection of all of us throughout time can't do it. Only God can satisfy himself. And that kind of makes sense, even on a human level, if you think about it. Because who finally satisfies you but you? In human terms, God satisfies himself. Now, this is a word of folly. This is a word of nonsense. This doesn't stand up to human reason. You did the wrong. You got to pay for it. But God says, nope, that's not the way it works in my system. Now, if you go to court and you are found guilty, you have to pay the fine. And you would look very foolish indeed if you didn't pay the fine. And then the judge wanted to know why. And you'd say, I'm waiting on God to pay it. It's a word of folly. It's foolishness to the world. But to us, to those like you and me who understand that this is the answer, it's wonderful. There's nothing better than to know that God has taken care of it when I couldn't and never could. It's wonderful. For us who were perishing in our bondage to sin, It's a word of wonder because we know now that we're being saved not by our power, but by the power of the living God. There is no better news. We preached Christ crucified where the rest of the world seems to be preaching all kinds of matters of glory. If you just do this, buy my book on self-help and those kinds of things. It's glory. You do it. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Try harder. And you'll succeed. Just think positive thoughts and positive things will happen. This is the nonsense that the church sees, but that the world promotes. And so we jump into the Beatitudes in our gospel reading today, and we see the proof of it all. Nowhere in there does it say, pull up your bootstraps. Nowhere in there does it say, tighten up your belt, let's go. Nowhere in there does it say, just be stronger. Nowhere in there does it say, think positive thoughts, then God will bless you. It says, blessed, which means the closest thing we've got in English, is happy. Happy are those. 
Blessed, though, it's bigger than happy. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Not poor, poor in spirit. What does that mean? That means you people, if you do confession and absolution correctly, that means you really do come here on Sunday morning and at that time in the service are contrite, recognize, have sat there and thought about, well, I have lied. I haven't done everything right. I'm not blameless. I do need God's forgiveness. And you treat it properly. And you confess your sin. That is a person who's poor in spirit, who knows that they can't deliver themselves. So blessed is the person who's poor in spirit because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God has given to them the opportunity to live in his house forever. And ever, the poor in spirit who know that they need God, not themselves. Theirs is the kingdom. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness in the world of fast food fortunes, we, we just got a new Culver's up around the corner. Did you see that? You can pay me for that ad plug later. In the world of fast food convenience and and appeasing our hunger, who wants to be hungry and thirsty? Who wants that? When we go out to eat for over 40 years, Susan has had to put up with this. Every time we go out to eat, what's the first thing that they want to know? Wherever you go, can I get your drink order? Can I get you something to drink? Susan will go, "Uh, is this a Coke or a Pepsi place? That's the first question that gets asked. And then she'll look at him and go, answer me. Because she really needs to know. She wants it to be a Coke place. She wants that Diet Coke because places don't serve tab. Yes, it's stacked up in our garage, that tab. So they look at me, what can I get you? And I said, nothing. Uh, Not even a glass of water. This is when I want to keep more contempt on my neighbor. Because I just said, what? Nothing. And what I want to say when they say, not even a glass of water, I don't even want to be polite. I just want to go, nothing. That's what nothing means. Nothing. Not even a glass of water. Forty some years. But the waitress is thinking, who wants to be thirsty? I just want to eat. See? But I digress. Blessed are the hungry and the thirsty, those who hunger and thirst for something specific, not Coke or Pepsi, nor cheer wine, not barbecue, whether mustard-based, tomato-based, or vinegar-based. None of these things, those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. And who are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness but the poor in spirit and the meek? They are the ones who want a certain kind of righteousness. Now, I got to tell you, when it comes to barbecue, people want a specific kind, right? I've been to South Carolina. I don't want it. Keep the mustard out of my barbecue. I want a specific kind of barbecue. But when it comes to righteousness, it seems to me people also want specifics. Some people want their own righteousness. Some people depend upon it. Look how holy I am, God. Look what a good person I am, God. I tithe, God. I've gone to church and Sunday school, God, for every Sunday for 39 years running. Beat that, God. But the poor in spirit want a different kind of righteousness. The hungry and thirsty for righteousness want a very specific kind of righteousness. They need a very specific kind of righteousness. They need God's righteousness, not their own. They need the cross. They need Christ and Christ crucified. For only in this way will God be satisfied and only in this way will you be satisfied. That's the promise. Hunger and thirst for his righteousness and you'll be satisfied. Why? Because you won't be trying to fill up that empty spot with your own righteous deeds anymore. Christ in God 
will be all sufficient to fill that hole when nothing else can. So, sinners, be content with Christ. Be content with Christ crucified. Doesn't mean you shouldn't try to stop that lion problem that you got, trying to just kind of scan the room, not look at anybody in particular. It doesn't mean you should not try to not covet. It should, doesn't mean that you shouldn't uh, honor the Lord's day. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't take the name of the Lord's name in vain and that you shouldn't try. It doesn't mean any of those things. But it does mean this, that when you fail, and fail you certainly will, God's got it. He's handled the problem through Christ, on the cross, in the grave, resurrected as we are about to confess. And that is what enables us to go to this table with confidence, to receive God's grace and strength once again in his own real body, his own real blood, sacrificed and shed for you, for each one of you, and for a whole world. We believe that because we believe in him, not us. May it be so at St. Mark's. Amen.